today. My name is Michael Kugelman. I'm the Senior Associate for South Asia at the Wilson Center. Our discussion today marks the latest event for the Wilson Center's Hindsight Upfront Initiative, which focuses on the implications of the U.S. withdrawal for Afghanistan, the region, and the world. And you can see previous Hindsight Upfront activities at afghanistan.wilsoncenter.org. And before I forget, I'd like to thank uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty for partnering with us on this event. RFERL is also the Wilson Center's media partner for its AFPAC file podcast series. The objective of our event today is to consider what the future may hold for Afghanistan from the perspective of those for whom this issue matters the most, Afghans. And I'm really delighted to have a panel of Afghan experts representing a variety of fields and experiences. We have a, an academic, a scholar, a journalist, an activist, and a police uh, official. Obaidullah Bahir is a lecturer at the American University of Afghanistan. Kadir Habib is the director of the Afghan Service for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Masuda Sultan is a women's rights activist and co-founder of All in Peace, and she's currently focused on a movement called Unfreeze Afghanistan. And finally, uh, Zala Zazai is a former investigation officer for the Kabul Police Command and had been one of the most senior female police officers in Afghanistan before the Taliban takeover. Conventional wisdom is that the future of Afghanistan uh, does not look very good. There is a devastating humanitarian crisis playing out, the worst in the world, according to aid officials. This is in of itself cause for alarm, especially in a country that even in better times suffers from deep levels of poverty, insufficient healthcare, drought, and so much more. But Afghanistan is also dealing with a new government led by the Taliban, which is not only a brutal force, but also uh, seemingly has little to no capacity to address a complex and potentially catastrophic policy challenge posed by the humanitarian situation. And on top of that, Afghanistan is also uh, threatened by terrorism, particularly from Islamic State Khorasan. The goal of this event is not just to underscore these challenges, which we all know about, but also to, to discuss potential ways forward. Is, are things really this bad? What can be done? And what can be done to at least avoid the most worst case scenarios? In a moment, I'll pose an initial question to each of our panelists to begin a conversation, and we'll have a discussion among ourselves. We'll also take questions from the audience. Uh, so if you have a question for a panelist, please um, uh, tweet it to at Asia program, or you can email it to Asia at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, please list your name and affiliation if you'd like us to mention them. So with that, uh, let's get started. And I'll begin uh, with Obaidullah. Uh, you, you study governance and politics. Um, this is your area of expertise. So I'd like you to focus on the Taliban government. And conventional wisdom, again, is that the Taliban confronts so many different and serious challenges, economic stress, humanitarian issues, terrorism, that it's going to be very difficult for it to consolidate power, especially amid reports of internal divisions within the Taliban. So my question to you, is can the Taliban consolidate power? What does it need to do to succeed in that goal in the weeks and months ahead? And what are its biggest obstacles to gaining legitimacy at home? Over to you. Uh, um, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's an honor uh, sharing the stage with the esteemed speakers here. It's always a pleasure talking to you, Michael. Um, <clears throat> I think we should take a step back. And the step back here is very often we, um, basically point blame towards the Taliban regime for a lot of the problems that Afghanistan's governance currently has. And if you look at it from a bird's eye view, um, a lot of this, the policies that were taken up by the previous republic were leading to this point. Um, uh, some amongst them were the overly centralized structure of governance, uh, all within the presidential palace that stripped the ministries of their institutional memory, of their genuine wor working uh, staff and the technocrats, and at the end of the day, with the president fleeing and all of those bodies being left to the Taliban with very little governance experience, it's obviously it would have been a challenge for any government to begin with. <clears throat> but with regards to the Taliban, there are quite a few issues that they've had. Uh, one was this general tendency towards the whole uh, denazification process, 
where uh, the whole mindset that they came in with was that uh, they were the victors and everyone who had stayed behind or worked for the previous regime. This is a question that you're asked by the Taliban officials uh, in a lot of checkpoints in Kabul, and they would look at you and they'd be like, are you associated in some way with the previous republic? So that's just, just general attitude, which meant that a complete cleanse was done within the government bodies. Very little bodies still have their previous stuff, which uh, didn't help in the whole brain drain process to begin with. And then on the second end, um, one of the major problems with the Taliban's governance is their own organizational structural problem as well. So if you refer to people like Antonio Gustuzzi, who have written extensively about the Taliban's internal structure, the Taliban were always a decentralized fluid insurgency. It was a conglomerate of splinter cells that were all fighting towards the same common cause. And then they were obviously being very passive about difficult conversations with regards to who was superior to the other. And once they took over Kabul uh, in a shock, even to them, um, they had to sit down and spend weeks just trying to figure out as to who was going to rank where. So turning a very flat organization into something taller is a major challenge for the Taliban. Um, the intergroup politics itself has uh, been coming up off late. We recently saw that uh, a tussle happened over the chair of the Afghan cricket board. Um, there's actually talk about the deputy minister of health having been shot um, by uh, members of the Taliban themselves. So there's a lot of internal politics that's stopping um, them from doing more. And um, lastly, there is just this absence of skill set, and the skill set's absence is majorly attributed to the lack of trust they have with outsiders. So um, a lot of the ministries that you visit in Afghanistan, you will see that uh, the people that are working closest to the officials are mostly Taliban members. They have very little to no education, uh, formal education to begin with, and very often uh, they're challenged with even the ability to read uh, documents. So all of those are complications that they're, they're facing. At the end of the day, it does sometimes make sense when they ask for more time to deal with or iron out those issues. The problem is that Afghanistan doesn't really have time. Um, considering the humanitarian crisis that is looming, the Taliban would have to get their act together if they cannot do so they will have to rely on uh, in a high of victory um, to realize the need that they have. So uh, the need, um, as in what I perceive of them, and when I see them doing the work that they're doing, their ministers are at times working 18 hours straight, but there are 18 hours that lead full circle and end up producing nothing um, tangible. So um, there are challenges. They have to get trained. They have to get uh, used to uh, the new governance role. And um, they have to gain the trust of the local population and learn to trust the local population or the educated elite if this government or if this structure is ever going to be sustainable. So uh, sadly, more challenges than opportunities. Uh, the conventional wisdom of conflict transformation and Ladakh saying that uh, post-conflict societies present an opportunity. Unfortunately, Afghanistan is in a situation where it's very bleak for us to even use words such as opportunities. So I think that should summarize uh, and get us going. Well, thanks a lot, though, by do. I mean, sobering words, but indeed, uh, more challenges and opportunities, and unfortunately, does sound uh, quite uh, accurate. Um, so thank you for that. I'd like to now go to, uh, to Zala, uh, to Zala Zazai. Uh, so you held a number of senior uh, posts during your time uh, as a police official in Afghanistan. So you were very focused on the security situation. Now, the Taliban uh, has claimed to restore security in Afghanistan by ending the war, by ending the conflict in Afghanistan. Um, what do you think we can expect for the security situation moving forward? And what should we be watching for in terms of indications of where things might be going security-wise? In other words, uh, what would be some potential signs that the security situation could be could take another turn for the worst? So would welcome some, some opening thoughts from you on uh, your views of the security situation moving forward. Uh, 
Uh, Tom, yes. <laughs> Uh, hello to you and uh, all dear guests that they are uh, here. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I want to uh, speak about the security situation. Uh, I, I think uh, how can we expect to improve the security situation when a tourist group uh, come to power? Uh, we cannot be optimistic at all to improve the situation. And uh, the situation will get worse until the activities of this terrorist group and uh, they should not be recognized because uh, it will be a big uh, treat to the people on all of the world. Uh, uh, Afghanistan, uh, the Taliban government is a coercive government imposed on the people of Afghanistan. No one want the Taliban in Afghanistan and it's a big problem uh, to our security situation. And I, I think uh, the situation will improve when the election take a place and we have a government. And I think in, in that uh, uh, time, we have uh, a, a good security situation uh, from uh, now. Well, uh, thank you for, again, a, a very sobering uh, opening comment. Uh, and I'm inclined to agree that uh, in the absence of certain unlikely developments such as elections in the future, things like that, uh, the security situation certainly will remain precarious. So I look forward to hearing more from you um, on that uh, as we as we go along here. Uh, I'd like to now move on to uh, Kadir Habib. Uh, so you are uh, a journalist focused on Afghanistan. Uh, you've overseen a team of journalists in Afghanistan. And uh, you know, clearly one of the big concerns for Afghanistan moving forward is the issue of rights uh, on many levels, but this includes media rights and press freedom. Uh, and there have been multiple reports of the Taliban uh, beating uh, or attacking Afghan journalists, even while foreign correspondents have continued to report from the country and it's seemingly unencumbered. And it strikes me that the issue of press freedom is, is particularly important in Afghanistan, especially because you, you don't have that many press reports outside of, of Kabul uh, and a few other major cities. Much of the press coverage, especially the foreign press coverage is, is in Kabul and not many other places. And there's been a lot of misinformation uh, floating around on social media about Afghanistan, particularly since the, uh, the US withdrawal. So what do you think the future holds for free media in Afghanistan? And what challenges will journalists face in, in, uh, in Taliban-led Afghanistan. Thank you, Michael. Uh, uh, pleasure to be on this panel. Uh, well, uh, the, there are all, met several challenges and many challenges I would say is mentioned by other colleagues and, and the prospect of the Afghan media look uncertain as the Taliban took control of Kabul. Uh, before coming to power, uh, Taliban and other militant groups have uh, regularly threatened and attacked journalists. And uh, uh, 12 journalists were killed and 230 others became victims of uh, violence. Uh, and uh, according to the Afghan uh, Safety Committee uh, report that is uh, released recently, uh, the report covers months from the last November until November 2021. And um, I, I want to mention here and remember one of our colleagues, uh, Mohammad Elias Dai, uh, who was killed in a bomb attack. A bomb was placed in his vehicle on November 12 in 2020. Uh, and, 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 and then series of attacks continued after that. That was just the beginning until the end of the, 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 those attacks that Kabul was taken over by the Taliban. At least 12 journalists were killed uh, by those attacks. Mostly no one took responsibility of those attacks. Uh, despite uh, those attacks uh, during the last year, uh, a booming media market had developed uh, during the last 20 years, with most outlets being privately owned. Uh, before, I guess, 2021, uh, there were dozens of TV networks and more than 170 FM radio stations. 
And now, almost uh, three months uh, of the Taliban takeover, uh, Taliban takeover uh, more than 70% of the outlets uh, nationwide had closed, um, according uh, to the National Union of Afghan Journalists. Uh, financial uh, problems and restrictions on media freedom were among the main reasons given. Um, Taliban officials spoke to uh, spoke of uh, media freedom uh, within the framework of uh, Sharia, Islamic law, and national values. Um, however, uh, we can see that uh, there was uh, significantly less criticism of the group in the media since uh, they have seized the power uh, on August 15. Um, a human rights watch in a statement um, on October 1st said that despite uh, the Taliban promises to allow media that respect Islamic values to function, the new rules are uh, suffocating a media freedom in the country. The Taliban, um, as you know, um, uh, announced 11 new uh, journalism rules on uh, September 19 that forbade journalists uh, to broadcast, publish the stories uh, that are contrary to Islam um, or insult national figures or violate uh, privacy. Um, right groups have said that the vaguely uh, worded rules uh, could use to prosecute journalists. Uh, when, when we are talking uh, to Afghan journalists inside the country and following the local media, we can see enormous changes in the free media environment in the country. Um, however, um, the Taliban policies are different from Kabul and provinces, as you mentioned, that we are getting less information from there, for instance, Journalists in some provinces have been told not to report about particular issues like women rights. But in some other provinces, the head of uh, culture information departments told the journalists that they should send their reports uh, for approval before publishing. Um, however, um, uh, Taliban spokesperson Zabiullah Mujahid uh, denied asking local officials to require journalists to obtain pre-approval for stories and instead blamed it on the officials' inexperience. Uh, so we can see that the, the that Taliban somehow they, uh, when they're in Kabul in press conferences, they are saying that they are committed to uh, free media and, and, um, and criticism but we have reports uh, on the contrary. And, and, and also you mentioned about the, the, the generals were beaten on the streets and uh, we, we, we watched the videos. And uh, since coming to power, uh, uh, the Taliban people have detained at least 32 journalists, uh, several of whom were beaten uh, in custody, according to the reports. And now there are concerns that uh, the Taliban are in the focus of international community, but as soon as the world's attention turns away, they might come up with uh, further uh, restrictions. But I, I, I think that there are several challenges at the moment, as uh, uh, our colleague in, on the panel uh, mentioned. So Taliban have to can have to come over all these challenges. And, and so during the, these three months, so uh, that, that, the, that time, I mean, the, 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 the time has been for now, we, we can see that probably they would need more time to, to see that how things will develop. But uh, I've mentioned what is, already reported and what's happening on the ground at the moment. So um, I, I, as a journalist, and, and we, our colleagues, we hope that the situation uh, change for better. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we could only we could only hope. Um, so I'd like to go to to Masuda uh, Sultan. I'd like to come to you with with what I think is really one of the essential questions for Afghanistan's immediate future. And we'll be getting into this uh, quite a lot uh, in, this, in this discussion, but I wanna to go to you first. You have focused a lot uh, on, the, on the current humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. And you know, we've been hearing all kinds of doomsday language from very senior aid officials, including the, the World Food Program Director, David Beasley, yesterday said, if I'm not mistaken, he said that Afghanistan will soon be hell on earth, or it is hell on earth. These are very strong terms to be used here. So my question to you is, how bad do you think the humanitarian situation could get in the coming weeks and months? Is this, this doomsday language that we're hearing an accurate description of what's going on? Is it really that bad? Uh, is it even worse? Is, is it not as bad? Uh, and also, do you think that mass suffering is still preventable at this point in Afghanistan, or is it too late? And do you think it's all but inevitable? So Masuda, over to you. Well, first of all, good morning and um, thank you. It's an honor to be with you and these esteemed panelists this morning, Michael. Um, the Afghan civilian population is going through a complete free fall, uh, an economic collapse unlike what they've seen um, probably in dozens of years. Um, what's happening right now is uh, uh, levels of hunger and famine that we have not seen. Uh, the World Food Program, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Mr. Beasley has said, there's 23 million Afghans marching towards starvation. Uh, it's going to be hell on earth. Uh, this is really a, a, a real tragedy for uh, Afghans. It's a tragedy that the international community um, hasn't been able to act sooner. Uh, just on uh, August uh, 15th, I remember during the fall, I, uh, I had uh, given an interview and I was concerned about 14 million Afghans uh, facing starvation. And now the number is at 23 million Afghans. So just in these, what, uh, uh, few months, uh, things have gotten so much worse. And all we hear is that this winter, um, we have uh, 3.2 million children that will uh, suffer from hunger. One million children could die this winter if nothing is done sooner. And we know that there are pledges being made by the international community, a little over a billion dollars pledged by the UN. The problem is, is that that's not enough and it's not coming fast enough. Um, given the tremendous challenges uh, faced right now on the ground due to the uh, collapse of the government, the collapse of the security forces, the uh, 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 collapse of, of, of all uh, public uh, workers are, are, are not being paid, so people are not able to go to work. Uh, the Afghan government, uh, uh, de facto government, can not pay the electricity bill um, to Uzbekistan, as you know, so the lights have effectively been turned off as the uh, troop withdrawal has happened, and the aid community has uh, uh, completely uh, been, I think, caught uh, uh, by surprise, uh, as has everyone. Um, but we absolutely need to think about what we can do uh, given the circumstances. And you know, uh, humanitarian aid, a billion dollars or so, is 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 really not enough. Um, Afghanistan had a budget of eight and a half billion dollars before. Seventy-five percent of it was paid by the international community. So if the international community uh, uh, is 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 helping with this billion, that's good. But um, how will it get there? There's a cash shortage. There's a, a shortage of Afghani cash notes, as well as a shortage of dollars, which is what is causing a, a, a real problem on the Afghanistan end. So in other words, when you transfer money to Afghanistan, and that's assuming you, you do because OFAC now allows you to, there's the general licenses 14 and 15. Many people are, are, are unclear on that. So even those uh, transfers are, are few and far between. But for NGOs, for example, who transfer money to Afghanistan, hoping to pay salaries or buy food or medicine for folks, they're really having a hard time because on the other end, uh, there's this limit of $200 a week. I understand now it has just been upped to $400 a week, um, but that's really not enough for an NGO uh, to be operational. I mean, I know several NGOs who have contacted me uh, begging for help to get money on the ground to people. Their own staff are starving. Forget about the, the, the beneficiaries that we're talking about that they serve. Their staff are starving. I, I know women who are um, uh, uh, in shelters in Afghanistan uh, currently who don't have food or, and don't have heat. Um, so 
and, and the NGOs, again, are sitting on, on cash that they can deploy. But the problem is on the other end, because of the shortage of cash, the central bank decree to limit the withdrawals, because what can they do on that side? So we absolutely need to look at solutions to this problem. And there are several. Um, a lot of this is related to uh, political will, I believe, um, at Unfreeze Afghanistan, where a group of um, women activists and civil society leaders who uh, have been working on these uh, on these issues, particularly our first concern, which we heard from our friends uh, a few very, few months ago, was that they, the teachers were not getting paid. Teachers have not been getting salaries since June. Um, that's pretty much the case across the public sector. It's the same for healthcare workers. Um, and so we've been talking to folks in, um, in Washington and other places to see what can be done for unfreezing their assets. And we know that for healthcare workers, the UNDP has announced that they're gonna pay 25,000 um, healthcare workers through a novel mechanism that um, avoids going through the Taliban um, uh, out of 70,000 estimated healthcare workers in Afghanistan. So that's a good step, but the money hasn't actually reached the ground yet. And that's a whole other piece of this um, that we can, we can talk about later. The point is the money's not coming fast enough. It's not coming in the levels that we need. There's a cash shortage and there's a liquidity crisis that we absolutely need to address in order to address the humanitarian challenge. Because it's not just about getting a billion dollars to people and everything will be fine. No, it's about unlocking, unblocking this chokehold that Afghanistan has right now on it that is affecting everyone across the board. Um, so uh, I'm happy to talk more about solutions. Uh, we're, uh, we're currently uh, kind of investigating some of the operational mechanisms of getting money over there and talking to folks. But I think the international community itself is is kind of uh, uh, going in circles trying to figure out uh, the proper solution. And look, the Taliban were not brought by uh, by any of us. You know, we may like them, we may not like them, but we have to deal with them. They're here. They're reality in Afghanistan. And if we're gonna uh, just pretend like we can serve the Afghan people without dealing with the Taliban, uh, it's not going to work. So we need high level engagement. I know Mr. Tom West, the Afghan uh, special representative from the U.S. Um, is on his way uh, to, to talk to them. Um, the US, uh, uh, we need the US and, and other actors to um, work together to arrange uh, some kind of negotiated roadmap for a way forward um, so that the Afghan people can get some relief in this very, very difficult time. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Masuda, for, for conveying the urgency of this humanitarian uh, crisis. Um, and you know, I think you, you may have alluded to this, but the overarching issue here is that Afghanistan, even in ordinary better times, is so heavily dependent on international assistance. I believe that at the time of the, uh, the Taliban takeover, uh, Afghanistan was dependent on international assistance for about 75% of Afghan public funding. So this is why indeed, as you suggest, that the humanitarian supplies, the food aid is essential but there's so much more need beyond that. Uh, broader development assistance, financial assistance is, is of the essence as well. But, and we'll get into this later, this is something that uh, many countries, particularly in the West, are hesitant to do to provide development assistance directly to the Afghan government because of course they have not recognized the Taliban government and don't want to. So uh, thank you for that. What I'll do is I imagine several of you may wanna to respond to what others have said um, uh, and I am going to ask a few more questions, but I know that Obaidullah wanted to make an additional comment. So I'll, I'll go, why don't we go back to you, uh, Obaidullah? Um, hey, I really appreciate all the remarks. I appreciate uh, Jala's uh, sentiment with regards to the Taliban and, and their current uh, way of functioning or governing and, and the coercive nature of governance. Uh, what has been happening to the journalists has been unfortunate. And, Masuda's whole point of view with regards to unfreezing Afghan money. <clears throat> and I, I just like to get into the details of it because you did ask me about the legitimacy issue and I thought it would make more sense if we did cover larger ground before we came back to the issue because at the core of it is this recognition and legitimacy issue um, that is stopping these funds as well. And it's extremely unfortunate that a lot of the political elite that were part of the problem in Afghanistan in the past 20 years that led to the hollowing out of the structure um, that it eventually collapsed the way that it did. Um, they are now um, 
propagating and advocating for sanctions and further sanctions on Afghanistan. And here's where the problem arises, because international aid is a band-aid solution, right? We are, I personally, with the aid effort that I lead in Afghanistan, I feel like it's being, it's money being thrown in the well with all the limitations that we have on the ground with regards to moving money, with regards to dealing with the Taliban, because a, a, a group that hasn't consolidated its own power and isn't very cohesive amongst itself, that means you get very, very different um, policies across provinces. Uh, the same uh, issue that was pointed out by Qadir Seb. Today, I got a reply from the governor of Maidan Wardag saying, you will absolutely not distribute anything on the ground here. I will be handed out the aid. I will dictate who gets the aid. Uh, and I was like, I'm sorry, that's not how it's going to work because uh, people have trusted me with this money. Unless I'm on the ground, I'm distributing it. I am selecting the families. It cannot work. I do appreciate aren't provided aid multiple times, but that's about it. Um, so it's difficult even negotiating that social welfare space. But again, unless the Afghan economy is revived. So look, um, right now, the Afghan health sector, every hospitals were reliant on the $600 million annual budget that was given to them for in order for them to function. So we have kids that are facing acute malnutrition in Mazar Sharif, and we don't even have drips um, to provide them. We have no medical supplies there to treat these children, and they're being moved to Kabul. Um, on the other end, at the whole concept of sanctions is extremely counterintuitive in a situation where you have an authoritarian regime, right? So the whole goal of sanctions is to put pressure on the general populace to eventually achieve behavior modification from the regime. But in a situation where the Taliban have unfortunately uh, achieved total victory and they are here, um, there's no way the general populace can influence the Taliban's behavior. So all that you're doing is making them suffer. And at the end of the day, the question here is, are we going to make millions of Afghans starve for the grander politics of things? Because there's a huge misconception with regards to the unfreezing money as well. And when I wrote a piece for the Washington Post highlighting the need for aid for Afghanistan, I did mention that it wouldn't get solved unless structural changes are done, unless the economy is revived. And that happens with the $9.4 billion, the lion's share of which is in the US, uh, is released into the economy because this, and, and my issue was I had the misconception that people understood that Afghan Federal Reserves meant Afghan Federal Reserves, right? And the comments that I got on that piece was a lot of the people that were commenting there thought that the money that was being released was US taxpayer money that was being given to the Taliban, right? And that's not true because at the end of the day, the fact that we stand in line, start standing in line at 4 a.m. in the morning only to get 400 bucks at 2 p.m. in the day is showing you that we have no access to our own money that is Afghan Federal Reserves. So at the end of the day, unless that money is re released, and I think the 0.5 billion that are in Switzerland and the 0.6 billion that are in two banks in Germany, they seem to be releasing sometime soon, but it really hurts the momentum that we are trying to generate for unfreezing the money when we have previous Republic elites going around using much larger influential circles to advocate for further sanctions. We saw Iraq, you have this example of Iran. These are both authoritarian regimes where the, the, the governance or the regime barely ever feels the pain of the sanctions. It's the common people that end up paying a price. And that in a situation where Afghanistan is already facing a drought, where the collapse of the regime means the institutions are gone, means that there's huge joblessness. And those that who have jobs, aren't getting paid. I am a lecturer that has barely gotten paid in three months. I don't know why I'm teaching. Maybe it's just because I'm a really good person. But that just shows you the challenges that common Afghans are facing. At the end of the day, they have to go back and, and feed their families. And I was at a ministry yesterday and a Talib fighter was telling me that he's ashamed of going home because he hasn't gotten paid in three months. So even the Talib fighters aren't, so there isn't enough money to go around to even pay their closest aides, right? How do you expect an economy to get by? And that doesn't mean I want recognition. 
their modern problems require modern solutions. There are ways in which a negotiated relationship can be established with the Taliban, specific norms and MNEs can be established. And this fund can be to a certain extent monitored as well. But at the end of the day, you cannot choke out the population like Masuda said, they shouldn't pay the price for grand politics. Thank you, Abadullah. And Masuda, I think you wanted to make a comment. Yeah, I think uh, Obaidullah really, really said it all. You know, the 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 mention of the the drought. It's the worst drought in 35 years. I mean, if you think of the challenges facing the Afghan population right now, between the collapse, between the the hunger, between the the banking freeze, between the worst drought in 35 years, between the global pandemic where you have two million. Uh, doses of vaccines sitting there, admi unadministered COVID vaccine about to expire. I mean, put all of these things in, uh, you know, together and uh, and look at what the international community's reaction is, as Ubaidullah said, it's a Band-Aid on a trauma patient. It's not nearly enough. So are people going to suffer? Yes, a lot of people are going to suffer this winter, regardless of what happens. A lot of people are going to die. And a lot of people are going to try to leave Afghanistan and go wherever they can. Um, and whether that's uh, you know trying to get over the border to Pakistan or Iran or to go further west to Europe. I mean, these refugee flows uh, uh, are something that are of concern to many countries in the West. Um, it baffles me why we're not doing more to keep Afghans inside Afghanistan um, so that we don't we don't face these uh, these refugee flows and how many people can possibly escape? I mean, we just saw the the great uh, 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 escape uh, at the end of the U.S. Uh, uh, war there with uh, you know what 120,000 people. Maybe there'll be another 70 or 80,000 people that get out. Um, there's been so much focus on evacuations, and I'm really uh, sad for everyone that it had to go through this. It's a terrible thing to go through, a terrible trauma. I myself am a refugee of the Soviet war we left uh, when I was a kid. So I, 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 I really uh, I feel compassion for those that have, that have had to leave. But those are the lucky ones that left. The almost 40 million people that are left are now left in this uh, complete dark uh, place. So um, what I wanna say about the unfreezing of the assets is um, there's been many discussions about this. We at Unfreeze Afghanistan were focused uh, so far on healthcare workers and teachers. UNICEF is uh, saying that now that they um, uh, would like to take responsibility for paying the teachers. And we're gonna uh, kind of follow that through and see, uh, hopefully it covers all of the teachers and all of the the schools uh, around Afghanistan, as you probably know, girls' schools one to six are open across the country, um, seven to 12. Um, there has been uh, eight provinces that uh, I believe up to, uh, it was just recently Herat uh, a day or two ago that allowed um, all grades to go to, to girls and boys to go to school. So there are some uh, potentially positive real positive things happening on the ground. I mean, it is, it is, there is some movement uh, uh, or an attempt by the population um, to get back to normalcy and an attempt by the Taliban to bring them back to normalcy. Um, so uh, the question of the funds is you could do a conditional release of funds um, uh, and require, for example, certain uh, either certain list of things that need to be done with them or a list of things that can't be done um, uh, so some kind of a process by which this money gets released is absolutely necessary. And as uh, uh, mentioned before, in Afghanistan has, has budgets already assigned by the donor community. For example, at the World Bank, the Afghan Reconstruction Trust Fund has money sitting there to pay Afghan health workers and teachers. What we're asking for is not any additional money for Afghanistan. They don't, they don't need to make new pledges at the UN. They just need to release the money that's there um, and give people a little bit of, of, of room to breathe. Um, I understand about a billion and a half of this uh, money belongs to um, individuals in Afghanistan. So if a person worked their whole life to save money, to try to maybe uh, send their kid to school or buy a house or for a medical emergency, you know, they don't have access to those funds anymore. And they can't even travel abroad for medical treatment, which is what, you know, many of the worst case uh, uh, um, illnesses uh, they would go for. So um, it, there are different ways to kind of skin this cat when it comes to the unfreezing bit. Um, uh, and our position is there needs to be this roadmap developed for a conditional release 
Uh, for example, for for girls' education, boys' education right now, the teacher salaries released, the healthcare salaries released, the other public uh, workers' salaries, for example, the electricity authority and others, and even the NGOs, of course, they even they're sending money, but they can't get the cash released on the other side. So that needs to be addressed as well. The business people who want to import food into Afghanistan, food prices have gone skyrocketed actually in the last few months. I just read something the other day that um, Afghans are paying 82% of their uh, uh, budgets are being spent on food alone. So that kind of gives you an example of what they're going through. But um, uh, our position is that their policy needs to change very quickly and that this uh, very bad situation can at least be somewhat uh, mitigated. Um, so uh, it's the nine and a half billion uh, or it's the ARTF money. Um, the IMF uh, has uh, around $500 million of special drawing rights. Um, there's different buckets of money one could approach to try to fix the problem. Uh, well, thank you for that, uh, Masuda. Um, I wanted to ask a follow-up question on this issue, and I invite others uh, if they'd like to weigh in to, uh, to do so uh, here. But, you know, I'll play devil's advocate uh, here. I think that m many could make an argument that the right thing to do is to end these sanctions. And we've heard this, uh, this argument from, from several of our panelists. But my own view is that it's very unlikely uh, that the US government, the least, is going to make that move. I think there's a tendency to look at the Taliban as not just a brutal regime, but as an entity that has close ties to Al Qaeda and to many other terrorist groups. And it does things that no other, that no other government does, uh, such as you know, essentially not have a blanket policy that allows older girls to go to school, that yes, you have had some provinces allowing older girls to go to school, but you still have so many Afghan uh, young women that are not allowed to go to school. And that's something that not even Saudi Arabia does. So this is to articulate the thinking of many in, in the government here that, to justify the view that it's not the time to end those sanctions. But I guess the related question to that is, if we assume that uh, some of that $10 billion or whatever it is in, in foreign reserves that have been frozen, uh, if we assume that's, that some or all of that money were to be uh, released, if you were to have development assistance flow into the to the government in Afghanistan, uh, you know, you're looking at a government that's very inexperienced and does not have experience crafting economic recovery plans. So it seems like there would need to be some very structured, very formal, very clear strategy on the part of the international community to work very closely with the Taliban government to make sure that all of that money comes in, is, absor is absorbed and is distributed and gets to the right people. And there's a lot of mistrust uh, for sure uh, within the US and the West when it comes to the Taliban on the whole. So I guess the question, I know that, that you know, Masood and Abuidala may maybe got into this a bit, you know, very briefly, what would come after that? What would have to come after the money is released, after the sanctions are ended, hypothetically, to allow there to be relief for, for the Afghan uh, people at this point. So I would open that up if, if any of you would like to uh, address that before we move on to something else. I can I can start off a bit and I think we'll hand it over to Masuda because uh, it, it's her field more than uh, it is mine. Um, <clears throat> but in general, um, again, just reiterating the idea that we need to get out of our conventional comfort spaces and start doing things that prioritize minimizing human suffering over um, pursuing uh, set protocols with regards to when a regime that we don't recognize comes to power. Um, what that means is that there is a lot of space and obviously at the core of it is the Taliban willingness and, and rationality to understand their own limited capacity. Because right now you go to some of the ministries and those are huge compounds that barely have four rooms that are functional. That means that they themselves don't have the workforce to fill in all the different aspects of the ministry's uh, work. Um, so other than their willingness to contribute, there also can be track two diplomacy initiatives as well. There can be consultancy initiatives where the Taliban regime can be approached by trusted entities that are majorly Afghan and can be supported by foreign entities. 
necessarily countries that the Taliban have better relations with that can come into these ministries and provide a consultation role um, in them managing these funds and learning how to govern. So um, at the end of the day, there is a very large conversation there to be had and a dialogue to be had with the Taliban. But I think the famous quotation uh, comes up here where for any dialogue and negotiation to succeed, it has to start. And like Masuda pointed towards that for us to ever achieve anything, we really need to start having this conversation of thinking about how we can help the economy of Afghanistan from collapsing. So uh, there are ways, it's just that we have to sit down and brainstorm because at the end of the day, this is a new situation. Uh, we've barely ever had an extremist group fight for 20 years, end up victorious and come into power in such a totalitarian sense. So at the end of the day, depends on what we prioritize. And if the priority is to limit human suffering, then we can sit down and find innovative ways to approach this problem and, and try and solve them. And it's not ideal solutions. They will always be Occam's razors. They will always be decisions that barely manage to address the issue, but it's better than doing nothing. Can I just uh, um, add to that, that uh, um, uh, in particular for the for the healthcare workers, the way that uh, the UNDP is, uh, is gonna do it is a novel mechanism. They will essentially, I think, be bypassing the Taliban government. So um, a lot of these uh, uh, healthcare workers and teachers, it's most of the same people that were working before, um, except for maybe some that have left or et cetera, some changes. But so these lists already exist um, of folks and most of them have bank accounts or you could look at, they've been paid through mobile money, through the telecom companies. So we've been talking to some of those folks who uh, have experience with that and the verification methods that they used. And I know that it wasn't perfect on the salaries for the armed forces, the security sector, um, the, the payments mechanism, but there have been many improvements in that. And for example, teachers of 45,000 teachers were paid um, through this mechanism by one of the companies that we talked to. So you could essentially, if you had the lists of, of, of employees uh, of the healthcare system and the education system, go ahead and pay those salaries directly into their, their, their accounts. But that would be one way to do it is to bypass the Taliban government. Another way to do it would be to work directly with the ministries. Um, and obviously you would um, wanna be careful with uh, working with folks that are under sanctions, but assuming certain ministries don't have folks under sanctions, you could in, 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 in practice uh, work directly with those ministries. Um, uh, and essentially, I mean, one way or another, the international community has to work with, with the Taliban if it's, uh, if it's, if it's not at a, if it's not at a, 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 a at, at a federal level, um, at least at the ministry level, there could be things that could be done. So there are mechanisms that are out there and we're finding that um, uh, folks are, 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 are maybe just need to put in a little more work to navigate, um, but it can be done. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, so I think we, we can agree that the humanitarian situation is, is really the big um, priority right now, the biggest concern. Um, but you know, there, there are other major concerns that, that definitely deserve attention as well. And I wanted to get back to the issue of, of rights uh, just for a moment. Um, you know, the issue of human rights is, is something that would likely be the main um, criteria for the likes of the US and the West. If they were to agree to recognize the Taliban government, don't think that's forthcoming anytime soon. Ironically, even though the US and Western countries have indicated that human rights, especially women's rights, will be a major criteria, if not the core criterion for recognition, uh, you know, these are not governments that are going to, quite frankly, spend a lot of time focused on figuring out how to advance uh, human rights uh, in Afghanistan. I think the focus is on other areas. So, you know, we know that uh, you have so many vulnerable communities in Afghanistan uh, living under the Taliban, women, uh, religious minorities, other vulnerable communities. So it's a very difficult question to pose, but, you know, I'll pose it anyway, just to see if, if any of you would like to address it. Um, you know, what if anything realistically can be done within the country, speaking about within Afghanistan, to provide the right incentives to the Taliban, uh, if there are any at all, to ensure that those that are most vulnerable do not need to feel uh, so vulnerable. And we know that many of those that are most vulnerable 
uh, are not in a position to leave the country. Some are able to, many are not. So many of them will be in a difficult position. So I, just to, if anyone wanted to offer any thoughts on this, on this social question of you know, what can be done, if anything, to address the plight of these communities in Afghanistan that will be very vulnerable under the Taliban. I think maybe Khadib can contribute. I, uh, I would uh, have a contribution in the end with regards to that, just to sure. answer it. Thank yeah, you. Uh, yeah, you're right, Michael. Actually, the human rights situation in Afghanistan is deteriorating, and the, the reports we have about the, the schools are closed almost all over most of the country, and, and women can't go to work. Even out of fear, they're not going out to work in, 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 in all over the country. So it's it's a very um, an important uh, topic and an issue. And uh, as we were talking about the humanitarian situation, I think the flow of uh, AIDS to, uh, to, to, to Afghan people, and uh, that will somehow allow the Taliban government as well to, to stand, you know, to, to, to get firmer, I mean, if if they are the the, the, the money is going in, so, we have seen we we were witness during the last twenty years. Despite there was government, there was structure, and and there were uh, the talents and I would say the expertise in, uh, inside the government and non governmental organizations were supporting that government, despite that. Uh, there, there was a huge corruption and, and the corruption pandemic uh, that hurt uh, international efforts to help Afghan people. I mean, overall, I mean, that, that, that uh, uh, billions of dollars of assist, uh, assistance that was going meant to for, for Afghan people, but what that was going to the pockets of corrupt officials. So it, it is, it is making it, I mean, even now it's making it difficult that when uh, the international community is saying that it's condition-based, that that aid should go directly to the Afghan people. Mr. Wahid himself, he referred to an incident today that uh, governor of uh, uh, Wardak province, I, as I remember, he said that uh, I will hand over the, the aid to people directly, so you're not allowed to do that. So it's a good example of that. And we are having similar uh, reports, uh, e even in our programs, call-in shows, people are saying that they are not receiving when the aid is coming to those vulnerable people. And, and when we are talking ab about vulnerable people, I believe that most of Afghan people are now vulnerable, vulnerable particularly women and minorities, religious minorities or ethnic minorities. So they are more vulnerable. So uh, I believe that the, the, what the international community is holding now is the leverage. That is the, 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 the uh, flow of cash and uh, add an assess assistance to the country and to the government. Uh, that, uh, that, that, that that is the only leverage at the moment they have. I mean, uh, that they can use for um, making Taliban more accountable and uh, their government accountable. So there are some demands from the Taliban, from the international community, and they have to met those demands. And, and I believe that that demands like women rights, uh, allowing women to work and go to work and go, and go to school and right of education. Uh, and uh, um, so, so these demands are somehow uh, conditioning or uh, putting conditions of on Taliban for receiving uh, the funds. So, and, and beside that, the uh, political uh, legitimacy that Taliban are seeking uh, at the moment, that is also condition based on, based on the condition from international community uh, for, uh, for uh, and, and asking them that they should 
they should uh, uh, um, uh, take care of uh, uh, the, the rights, the basic rights of people. So um, I believe um, not only women and, and minorities, the all over, I mean, the, the, the basic rights of Afghan people, they, they have to uh, uh, have access uh, to, to information, to, to education, to, 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 to those basic rights. I mean, they have to, uh, the, the, the Taliban have to recognize those rights. And, and that I believe would uh, somehow Probably we, as we are moving forward, we we, we want to see that it's, that is uh, that might help them to get the instruction from international community and also uh, that funds somehow released and that assistance and aid uh, uh, flow once again start uh, to Afghanistan and to to Afghans and 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 and, and the smaller communities. Uh, around the country. Uh, thank you. Um, did anyone, Obadula, did you want to weigh in? Anyone else want to weigh in before we move on? Yeah, um, so uh, one thing that uh, I like to talk about is what happens, right? What, what, what's the solution? Where are we headed, right? It cannot I know the current trajectory isn't very healthy, but then what are the viable options with regards to any change in Afghanistan's fortunes? And that's beyond just the economy of it and the politics of it. And, and, and I'm going to propose a radical idea. We tried fighting for 20 years, right? So all the muscle and might of the world got together. And 20 years later, we end up with a Taliban that are even more powerful than they were 20 years ago. Now, what exactly went wrong? Despite the blame that we can um, attribute to the Republic, their failures, the United States policies, but at the core of it was that nothing changed for the rural population of Afghanistan. The same rural population, they were suffering from this economic deprivation um, 20 years ago. And all that the Republic ended up doing was to show them that they were going to concentrate the development efforts and everything that they had on a very elite min minority within the urban population. So for the rural population, it things only got worse. So the uh, the smaller things like justice, like um, like like sort of some sort of safety that they enjoyed twenty years ago, they were stripped of those for twenty years, two decades, and that meant. And and here's uh, the idea: a lot of people think that. Um, the Afghans got what was coming for them and the fact that they and the whole their feed into the Taliban narrative of saying well we took over the country in 11 days that means we're very popular amongst the population um, and on the other hand they say well we're very powerful as well that's why we could take over the country in 11 days and the reality of it is one of the major reasons they took over the country was the indifference of the rural population so the rural population really couldn't care less uh, as to who came to power so then how does change happen um, we've tried the outside to inside approach, didn't work. We tried the coercive approach, didn't work. So then the solution is, let's start with making sure that the basic needs of Afghans are met. Let's try and make sure that there's some sort of organic evolution in people's understanding of their rights, of what they want, because me, Masuda, Jala, Qadir Seb, we represent a very small proportion of Afghanistan's educated population. The majority of Afghanistan is in the rural areas. And unless they start wanting better, unless they start understanding what their own rights are and what they can require of the government, it's, it's nothing's going to change. So it's a long-term project, but it happens when civil societies within Afghanistan are giving enough space to operate and, and create discourse and uh, basically work in fields that force the Taliban to acknowledge their existence. And with that, they start spreading this, this idea, this evolution of thought amongst the rural majority of Afghanistan, then change will come itself, then regime change will happen, Taliban behavior modification will happen, else they would be faced with a grievance level that will push them out. So. Um, 
let's take the longer route this time. Uh, the shortcuts, the silver bullets never worked. Um, and, and, and I think we'd have to take it upon ourselves to work towards a more grassroots level change from within Afghanistan if we're ever expecting uh, the next regime after the Taliban to not be just as bad or worse than the current Taliban regime. Well, thank you. And I think when you, we, it's, it's natural when you look at the scale of Afghanistan's challenges now and the scale of the humanitarian crisis, there's a tendency to think, oh, we need quick overarching comprehensive solutions. But you know, I agree with you that uh, incremental grassroots approaches are really the most practical and really the only ones that can work uh, realistically. So um, thank you for that. We have some questions that have come in uh, and I should remind you in the audience, um, if you wanna pose a question, uh, tweet your question to at Asia program or email it to Asia at Wilson Center. That's all one word. Dot org. Um, but I uh, wanted to ask a question from the audience. I wanted to direct it to Zala because it focuses on security. Um, and it comes from uh, Sarah Fraser at George Washington University. And the question relates to uh, ISK, the Islamic State Khorasan, the Daesh, uh, the terrorist group. Um, and the question is essentially, uh, how big of a threat do you believe that um, ISIS-K will pose to the Taliban's hold on power in Afghanistan uh, moving forward. So uh, Zala is someone who had served in, uh, in security positions for, for quite some time. Wondering if you have any thoughts on this issue, this challenge posed by, by ISK. And of course we know this is a challenge given what it's done um, really over the last five, six years in Afghanistan, but certainly over the last few months, it's carried out a number of mass casualty attacks, including a few that hit Shia mosques uh, in Kabul and Kandahar. So Zala, any thoughts you have on ISK? Welcome. I think you're muted, uh, Zala. We're not hearing you. Uh, it seems like you're still muted. Um, that's okay. We could, um, oh, sorry, try one more time. Yeah, unfortunately, it looks like you're having some audio problems. Um, why don't I, sorry, while you're working on that, why don't, first of all, does anyone else want to address the question of, of ISK before I move on to, um, to another question? Uh, if not, okay. Um, so, uh, there's a really I interesting think you, you can Sorry? you could come back to the question. I think you can come back to the question uh, as well because it's it's a very important question. I just wanted to uh, contribute that one of the issues and and one of the criticisms I've been leveling at the Taliban and and giving feedback uh, to them with regards to is the way they're handling the ISK threat as well because uh, one of the reasons the insurgency in Afghanistan was revived after 2003 was basically the extreme lack of cultural sensitivity and understanding of the Afghan, Afghan population and creating more grievances than they solved. So the detention centers, the rendition, the indiscriminate bombing, the night raids, those were all key features to why the insurgency eventually found popular support uh, within their localities. And right now, the Taliban's conduct, especially in areas like um, Jalalabad and Ningrahar, where they're indiscriminately um, offing uh, their opponents. So just uh, word of mouth and hearsay can uh, get you taken away from your house. You are tortured. My friends have already been beheaded uh, by the Taliban intelligence um, within Ningrahar, right? And those are educated people that had spent prison time under the Republic and, and, and were locked up by the United States as well. So at the end of the day, you don't understand as to uh, who is friend and foe right now. And it's, it's just the extreme brutal tactics that they're choosing. They're trying to fight fire with fire. And that, for anyone who understands anything about counterinsurgency, is extremely irrational because it ends up creating more grievances and more enemies than it, it resolves. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, and, and indeed, as you suggest, I mean, this is a big problem uh, for Afghanistan, for the Taliban. You know, one could argue that uh, you know, ISK could well get stronger uh, than it is just because you have the possibility of 
some Taliban foot soldiers um, who have struggled to transition to civilian life and want to keep fighting, they could well jump ship and shift allegiances to ISK. There have been some reports, as many of you will know, I believe uh, the Wall Street Journal had a report that there have been some members of the former Afghan security forces who have joined ISK. Small numbers for sure, but still, this is very troubling. Before we go on, uh, Zala, did you want to try one more time um, if your audio is okay? Because it would be great to get your perspective if, if we're able to hear you. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we're still not uh, able to hear you. I'm sorry about that. Uh, hopefully that'll be worked out soon enough. Um, another, another question from the, uh, from the audience, um, a very interesting one. Um, Question about SIVs, Afghan SIVs. And of course, here we're talking about Afghans of special immigration status. These are those Afghans that had worked with uh, US, the US military, have been trying to get out of Afghanistan. Uh, and I guess, I, I guess I'd direct this to Masuda, who may be best placed to answer this because she's in the US. The question is, for the SIV Afghans who have reached the USA safely, can we learn with them about what went wrong in Afghanistan the last 20 years? Um, well, I'll leave it at that. So it's an interesting question. Um, I realize that it may not be easy for many of you to answer. Masuda, you've unmuted. Oh no, you haven't unmuted, but I see it. Did you want to respond? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I know many wonderful SIV uh, folks here uh, in Virginia and elsewhere. I think um, they, they, it would be good um, as many of them were involved either as, you know, it, it's SIV is not just for translators and interpreters. Um, they were also folks that worked on development projects on US contracts of various sorts, uh, both military and uh, aid and other projects. So um, absolutely, I think it would, I think there's, everyone's going to be doing reflecting um, on, on, every, on, on what happened. Um, and the SIV folks mostly had a front seat to uh, what was going on in the country. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm certain that um, if, if they were tapped, uh, to be honest about what they thought, you know, everyone had a role in this. Uh, we always, as uh, Afghans, we, we point fingers to our leaders and say uh, uh, you know, what they did wrong. Uh, but what we maybe might be lacking is looking internally at ourselves at times and saying, what role did I myself play in this uh, chapter of Afghanistan. And I hope that um, SIVs, as well as um, the leadership of Afghanistan, does take um, some time to truly reflect on everyone's role um, in creating this mess that we're in. Uh, well, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to go to another question, sort of looking further into the, um, into the future, uh, so to speak, and getting back to these issues of what can be done. We all can agree that there's so much, there's so many terrible things happening right now. We all know about that. Um, and one of my goals with this event was to try to get a sense as to um, what can be done that wouldn't necessarily bring huge improvements or even significant improvements, but also, but more so, if there's anything that could be done to ensure that at the very least the worst case scenarios don't play out on, on many levels in terms of the humanitarian crisis, in terms of terrorism risks, in terms of crackdowns on the media. Very difficult question to answer, but just thought that, you know, since we want to focus on the future here, um, if anyone would like to comment on that, on, uh, you know, the, the, this notion of what can be done that doesn't solve the problem, but at least makes it more easy to manage, so to speak. So would welcome any thoughts on, on that in the areas that you focus on. Can I jump in here? Sorry, I know I've already kind of talked quite a bit about the unfreeze uh, work that we're doing. Um, it's unfreezeafghanistan.org, by the way, where we have our fact sheet and uh, details. Um, you asked earlier about this way forward and um, respect for women's rights and uh, women's right to work, um, girls' rights to go to school. Uh, there is uh, no question that Afghanistan has been at the bottom of the list for many, many years when it comes to women's well-being. In fact, if you look at the Georgetown Women, Peace and Security Index, Afghanistan has come out as the worst country in the world for women. Um, and that is uh, not unusual for the past several years that the index exists. And many other 
uh, indices that exist for, to measure women's well-being that Afghanistan is often, if not the last on the list, the worst place, it's top you know, two or three. So I think we, uh, we need to take into account uh, where women are, and then we need to think about ways that we can improve their lives. Um, so when I think about uh, uh, women's rights, I think about um, their health statistics, which are some of the worst. Uh, they have some of the worst in Afghanistan, the worst maternal mortality rates and infant mortality rates. Um, those need to be improved. Um, there needs to be further investments in, um, in women's health. Um, and so we were doing really well on these indicators, by the way. I think the brightest spot of the international community's intervention in Afghanistan for 20 past years has been on these specific maternal mortality, infant mortality, um, girls' education, uh, and women working. So how do we how do we not roll back that progress, and how do we build on it so we um, do better? Girls' education and teachers' right to work. The teachers, there's 220,000 teachers in Afghanistan. Half of them are women. So if you look at, uh, uh, and it's number one uh, employment. I'm sorry, I have a little noise, one second. Um, half of the 220,000 teachers of Afghanistan are women. It's the largest employment block of women. So when you talk about women's right to work, of course, you're going to look at the teachers and say, they absolutely need to be employed. They need to have the right to work. And the women who are working at the ministries should all go back. I know for the interior ministry passport office, women have gone back, women have gone back to the airport. Um, so all of that needs to happen. Now, when you talk about conditioning aid, you want to condition them to the outcomes, right? So you want girls' education to be funded. You should release money for girls and boys' schools to pay their teachers. It's uh, We don't need to overcomplicate this either because the world which we want Afghanistan to be in versus the reality that it's in right now is very, very different. And we as the international community should really think about uh, uh, kind of simplifying our outlook on uh, how we approach this. So uh, again, for for, for girls' education and women's right to work, I think we can tie, for example, aid to that. Open the schools, you'll get X amount of in, you know, uh, uh, support um, money that we've already set aside. Um, let, let the teachers all go to school and work, including the women teachers. I think you'll see that happening. And I think it's, it's already starting to happen. So these are the very big ones that we wanna tackle. Then on the other issues of women's rights, I think we need to look at rights of inheritance, uh, rights to marriage. It's, you know, 60 to 80% of women in Afghanistan face forced marriages, um, underage marriage, all of those kinds of things. That needs to be a long-term comprehensive plan that addresses all of these issues. But in the immediate, uh, our view at Unfreeze is that girls' education, women's right to work, those are the two very, very fundamental things that need to be uh, protected. And that can be done with this conditional release of aid. Thanks a lot for that uh, intervention. I, yes, go ahead. I would please. like to jump in here uh, a little bit about uh, the worst case scenario and, and rights issues. I think that uh, during the, if we take a look at the last two decades, there have been significant achievement when it comes to women rights and education and free freedom of speech or freedom of the press in Afghanistan. Um, well, we are, let's say that we are starting from zero under new conditions and a new regime uh, with different uh, ideology and, and, and different view of the situation that's uh, in the country and, and, and also international community. I believe that uh, they don't want Afghanistan to collapse and they don't want, uh, I mean, European Union, they don't want a new flow of a wave of migration to, 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 to their borders. So that's why I believe that they have committed uh, new uh, this hundreds of millions of dollars and euros of assistance to Afghanistan. So I believe that the, the, the transparency in the whole process of aid and the commitments that is the government is making, the acting in government of the Taliban, uh, an oversight uh, uh, of, of, of uh, implementing those commitments. Uh, that is, I think, it's very important. 
and that comes with, uh, I believe, with the free media, uh, and and I believe that uh, uh, Taliban says that they are committed to free media, but they need to show it uh, uh, on the ground and and allow the journalists. Um, and media that's al already now somehow operating inside the country to do their work as they, um, as, they, as they want to do. I mean, they should allow them to do the investigative journalism and to have an oversight uh, uh, on their actions when it comes to egg distribution, for instance, uh, when it comes to uh, other commitments, when it comes to like, uh, uh, allowing women to go back to work. Uh, so our uh, other instances uh, are there. So I believe that the, an oversight, a media can play, a free media can play the, 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 the important role of a watchdog uh, in a society that holds the uh, officials accountable and and, and I believe that the, that is the that is the way forward. Uh, that would help the international community and also the Taliban uh, if they are really committed to uh, freedom of expression and if they are really committed to their commitments uh, they have made to the international community. Michael, just to add uh, to all of that, uh, I think one of the major problems for Afghanistan is two very different visions of uh, Afghanistan ended up colliding, coming face to face. And here we see that the Taliban are now in power as to what form the reconciliation process is going to take is an important discussion. Obviously, just to be politically correct, uh, there are truisms that we stand by women rights that rights of minorities should not be undermined in any way and so on and so forth. But that being said, um, we have to understand that there is um, a necessity now um, to accept whatever space we can manage to get. And that means that um, we, we get in, we deal with whatever is afforded. And the issue here is so delicate that um, there's a saying that says, between those who rule by force and, and, and the people, there's a hair strand. If pulled, tugged too hard from either end, it would snap. So with the Taliban right now as well, the international community is in, is in a dilemma as well, because the more you press them on issues that they think are core and fundamental to their identity, the more you're achieving rigidity from the group rather than more compliance. Um, so then who discusses those issues that are fundamental to their identity? Imagine communities normally consume this data from uh, groups that they can associate with and they have lesser othering with. And, and those are Afghans. Those are, those, those, that's the organic Afghan civil society that can try and, and negotiate this sort of have a dialogue with regards to the reconciliation process of Afghanistan. Um, it's not easy. It's easier said than done. It's going to take a long time. But uh, do we have any other better options? Because coercion and, and, and sanctions really aren't getting us anywhere and cost too much suffering. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we've got about uh, 10 minutes uh, left and there are a few more questions I wanted to, uh, to pose. Hopefully we could get you all to, uh, uh, to weigh in uh, briefly. First one, I think it would be useful to, uh, to take advantage of having an all Afghan panel to ask this question. And that is, what, what do you think the world most gets wrong about Afghanistan these days? And we know that the world got a lot wrong about Afghanistan over the last 20 years, which is one reason why this, this US-led war effort went bad. But talking about right now or recent weeks, i uh, be curious if any of you would like to weigh in. Is there one thing that you've read or heard that's made you jump up and say, no, that's not right at all, uh, and I wish I could correct the record, um, particularly something that you think could have impact on Afghanistan's future? So I don't know if anyone would like to weigh in on what you think uh, the world gets wrong about Afghanistan. Anyone want to uh, comment on that? Yes, please go ahead, Obadullah. 
I mean, a, a lot of times what I read, especially on the international spaces is, well, the Afghans chose this, so they get to reap what they sow, right? Uh, which is such an unfair characterization and grouping um, and generalization over the Afghan population. At the end of the day, the Taliban members cannot even fill government offices. That's the size of their group uh, compared to the larger 40 odd million population of Afghanistan. So they didn't choose this. Uh, there was a very complex Uh, and in unfortunately, yeah. Uh, um, can you hear me? Yes, you cut out for a second. Uh, please go ahead. Go ahead now. Please don't move too much. You guys are taking up all the bandwidth. So <laughs> stay. Still. So so yeah. No, I'm just saying that at the end of the day. Uh, The blame should not be put on entity. The funds, just the sentiment should be lost. Uh, thank. We caught some of that, Abdullah. But unfortunately, you cut out a few times. Um, it's been very good. Abdullah is in is in Afghanistan, where connectivity is not always good. It's been great uh, up to now. But um, we will, we'll come back to you again. Um, in a few minutes. Does anyone else want to weigh in on this question of what the world gets wrong about uh, about Afghanistan? No? Oh, yes. Zala, please, let's, let's go ahead. Uh, unfortunately, we still can't hear you. Um, you may want to try to remove your headset, see if that makes a difference. Not sure you could hear me. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, it's too bad we still can't hear you. Um, I apologize for that. Does anyone else want to weigh in, uh, Masuda or Kadir? There's one more question I wanted to pose before we wrap with final thoughts, but does anyone else want to get to this question of what the world gets wrong about Afghanistan? Sure, I'll take a, a shot at that. Um, you know what, I've, uh, I think there's, a there's obviously a lot that we've gotten wrong on Afghanistan, considering how this is all unfolded. Um, many things one can study. And uh, I'm sure that will happen in the years to come. But one thing that I often um, uh, uh, these days think about is how in the previous government, there were such high levels of corruption that were tolerated. And many, many people were uh, complaining about this corruption um, and nothing was being done about it. Um, and so now that um, Afghanistan is where it is, people seem more concerned about corruption than the fact that folks are starving. Uh, so it, it, it feels like the pendulum has swung from one end uh, where we were just, you know, we were, we were fine with giving money and uh, uh, we were fine with uh, uh, the high levels of corruption that were existed. But now suddenly um, we've gone to the extreme other end where we're so concerned about uh, uh, potential corruption. And quite honestly, uh, from what I've been hearing from a lot of the business folks uh, who operate there in terms of customs revenue collection, in terms of uh, other processes they deal with, they're all saying that there's less corruption in this, in this current state than there was before. Now, I don't know if that can be sustained, but um, I think one has to kind of reset a little bit on that, uh, on that front because we've, we've swung way too far the other, the other way. Well, thank you for that. Um, we should, uh, unfortunately, we're gonna have to start uh, wrapping up and I would wanted to invite each of you to offer a final thought, but the, the final question that I would leave you with, which you're welcome to address, again, it's not an easy question, I'm not asking easy questions, is um, you know, if you could take out your crystal ball and uh, try to make a reasoned judgment about what Afghanistan may look like in November 2022, a year from now, Will things be worse? Will things be better? Will they be the same? And what are some factors or trends that you would suggest to our audience um, that can be identified that would uh, most in, that may impact what Afghanistan looks like a year from now? So, in other words, what type of signposts should we be looking for, uh, or should we be looking out for, to give us an indication of where Afghanistan could go, what direction it could take 
uh, in the next year. So that's the final question I leave you with, but uh, I would invite uh, all four of you, uh, connections permitting, to, um, to weigh in very briefly with just a final uh, comment. Uh, who wants to go first? Um, uh, Obadullah, should we go to you while you're still, while your connection seems to be okay? Yeah, because um, in the, the be too um, optimistic about uh, stuff in Afghanistan. So I'll just give it a quick go. I know we are um, short uh, on time as well. So um, unfortunately, I don't want to be a bearer of bad news. And I've been constantly preaching for hope and saying that it's not the end of the world and there's much that we can do. Um, sadly, considering all the factors that are at play right now, the trajectory isn't really a uh, happy one. And I think that considering the tensions within the Taliban as well and the lack of resources going around, if the sanctions stay in place, um, we might have more infighting amongst the group. We might have uh, an, a, a, an opportunity window opened up for ISIS because again, the moment the Taliban fail, ISK has been acting as the net that has been catching one who defects from the Taliban and the Taliban with their behavior right now are sort of pushing all their enemies into one rank. So you have the NRF, you have the uh, previous ex A and ESF members and then ISK who are all um, have the muscle power when, when they get together um, that they will create a major headache. So the only thing that we'd gotten out of this post-conflict society was that we'd reached post-conflict. But it looks like that is going to be very sustainable considering the current uh, trajectory. And I hope the Taliban realize themselves because at the core of a lot of the issues that we talked about is the Taliban's willingness to um, accept limitations and, and be more rational. I hope for the sake of Afghanistan that they can. Absolutely, uh, agreed. Uh, thank you, Abdullah. Um, Kadir, why don't we go to you next for your final thought? Yeah, thank you, Michael. Actually, uh, it is very difficult to predict that what will happen next year. Three months before, no one was, uh, was expecting that today we will have this discussion, probably. Uh, so it is also uh, difficult today to, uh, to, to foresee that what will gonna happen. Uh, I, I believe that one thing is uh, the power of Afghanistan is that uh, when we are looking into discussions and also analysis, uh, we see that they're comparing Afghanistan of United States with Vietnam and, and with another conflicts around the world, which is, I think it's not the case. Afghanistan cases, uh, something uh, as, as an independent case, what's going on in that country and what's happening. Um, I, it is, I, I would say that it's a very young country. Uh, I believe that over 50% of the population born after 9-11. Uh, so the, I believe there is a, a big potential uh, in, in that population. And uh, there is a big hope uh, in, in, in them that they will uh, they could do something if 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 they they find a better way to be I mean uh, to 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 communicate and 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 they've got the better opportunity uh, let's say for instance if they had the opportunity of better education in the in, or of better um, involvement and 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 in in the society in a way of uh, that. Um, uh, Obaidullah Bahir earlier indicated that this, this uh, grassroots civil society become more active, um, that we, we, could, we could be uh, hopeful for the future. Uh, but uh, looking into the situation and the challenges uh, at the moment, I think it's very difficult to be uh, very optimistic for the next 12 months that we will be in a better situation in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Kadir. Uh, Masuda, why don't we go to you for your uh, final brief uh, comment? Thank you, I'll make it very brief. Um, I, I know the next um, 
six months are going to be very hard uh, uh, for folks in Afghanistan. Um, but I believe if 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 we can get through this this harsh winter and come out on the other side in the spring, um, hopefully have a little bit more of the humanitarian crisis um, under control and have people have the ability to go back to work. A little bit of stability for Afghanistan, um, I hope after this uh, this winter. You know what, really at the end of the day, I'm, I know it sounds, uh, sounds funny, but I am um, always optimistic about Afghanistan because of the people of Afghanistan. When I look at Zala Zazay, when I look at Obaid here, these are, these are young people that really have worked and continue to work to improve the lives of Afghans. And th these young people are, are, are a force to be reckoned with. Now these new Afghans that are, have come up through the educational system, um, many of them have studied abroad. Um, I wanna see all of them go back to Afghanistan, those who aren't there, and I, want, and I believe and I still believe that there is an Afghanistan awaiting all of us where we can return and be a part of it. And um, that's uh, the hope that I have for Afghanistan over the next year. Uh, well, thank you very much, Masood. It's always great to try to end on an uplifting note. I'm glad we were able to, uh, to do that uh, given the circumstances. Uh, unfortunately, we have come to time. It's 1230. We need to wrap up. This has been a a really terrific discussion. I'm really glad that we did this. I'm glad we're able to convene such a great group of, um, of Afghan experts representing such different walks of life to weigh in on all these very difficult, complex challenges and to try to discuss the future and to go beyond lamenting how bad things are now and trying to look at, uh, at what can be done on practical levels. So uh, again, uh, Obaidullah Bahir, uh, Masuda Sultan, uh, Habib Qadir, and also uh, Zala Zazai. And I do apologize, uh, Zala, that we couldn't get to you more because of the audio troubles. Hopefully we'll have you again um, and that, that won't be a problem. But uh, thanks a lot um, to our audience and thanks for the great questions. Sorry, I couldn't get to, um, to all of them, but um, I wish everyone the best. Stay safe, stay healthy and uh, take care. We are adjourned. <laughs>